This recording is protected by copyright. No part may be reproduced without the prior permission of the University of South Australia. Good evening. My name is Jacinta Thompson and I'm the Executive Director and Events and Exhibitions Producer of the Bob Hawke Prime Ministerial Centre. I would like to acknowledge that the University of South Australia meets on the land of the Kaurna people. We wish to express our respect for the Kaurna people, their elders and ancestors, and acknowledge the spiritual and cultural relationship the Kaurna people have with their traditional land. I extend that respect to Aboriginal peoples from other areas of South Australia and Australia. I would like to welcome you all on behalf of the Hawke Centre and the University of South Australia to our online presentation with Professor Bain Atwood. Tonight, Bain will be joined by Senator Patrick Dodson, Shadow Assistant Minister for Reconciliation and Constitutional Recognition of Indigenous Australia, as they discuss Bain's latest book, William Cooper, An Aboriginal Life Story. Bain Atwood is Professor of History at Monash University and has held fellowships at the University of Cambridge and Harvard University. Senator Patrick Dodson is a Yawuru man from Broome in Western Australia. He has dedicated his life work to being an advocate for constructive relationships between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples based on mutual respect, understanding and dialogue. Senator Dodson has extensive experience in Aboriginal affairs previously as Director of the Central and Kimberley Land Councils and as a Commissioner in the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody. This is truly heartfelt and insightful research about an extraordinary man, his family and community and their fight for justice. It is now my great pleasure to introduce Professor Bain Atwood and Senator Patrick Dodson. Thank you. Can I begin by thanking Senator Pat Dodson for being willing to participate in this conversation today about my book on William Cooper. It's both an honour and a privilege. I'd also like to pay my respects to William Cooper's people, the Yorta Yorta Nation, and I'd like to thank the Hawke Centre at the University of South Australia for hosting this event. I'm very privileged to be on this, um, this call and to be part of this process in acknowledging um, Mr. Cooper, and to celebrate your uh, uh, writing the book, uh, Bain, I, I want to acknowledge the Yorta Yorta people. They seem to have been an extraordinary group of people who've survived to this day, despite the High Court judgment saying they didn't hold native title. I'm sure that would have galled Mr. Cooper immensely. But uh, why is Mr. Cooper not as widely known amongst Australians? Can you, can you tell us something about that? I think this is a really important question. I, I've heard historians in the past say that if we compare, say, Australia and New Zealand, that many more Pākehā New Zealanders than settler Australians know the names of Māori leaders than to hear settler Australians know the names of Aboriginal leaders. And in trying to ex explain that, I think what's continues throughout this country's history is either an inability or an unwillingness to recognize Aboriginal leaders. And maybe this goes back to what happened right at the beginning. And again, if we compare Australia with New Zealand, uh, as I guess we all know, that when British colonization formally begins, in New Zealand, the British Crown makes a treaty, the Treaty of Waitangi, with Māori leaders. And in doing so, they treat Māori as though they're sovereign, that they regard them as sovereign. And so right from the outset, one might say that Māori leaders are recognised, whereas, as we all know, in Australia, there is nothing like a treaty with the exception of Batman's Treaty in Melbourne, which both the colonial and imperial government refused to recognise. And so right from the outset, I think there's ways in which 
not only Aboriginal sovereignty, but Aboriginal leadership is, is pushed aside. And I think what happens in the beginning of any country's history can be of fundamental importance to, to what happens later. Now, it's often said Australia suffers from a great silence. The famous anthropologist Bill Stanner called it the great Australian silence. But I think many people probably misunderstand what Stanner was saying. He, he wasn't talking about a literal silence. What he was saying emphatically was that there had been a great deal of forgetting in Australia's history. And of course, you can only forget something that you knew in the first place. And so I think we've got an ongoing problem here. It's not a problem of silence. It's not a problem about a lack of talking about Australia's black history. I think the problem lies in the fact that the white fellas haven't listened when Aboriginal people and their fellow white Australians have been talking about Australia's black history. And so with the process that the Uluru Statement is calling for, a process of truth telling, I think what's gonna be absolutely vital is that alongside the truth telling, there's a process, if you like, of truth listening. Well, that's what I would call it, truth listening. I guess in this context, what, what comes to mind is that the very fine Australian historian, Henry Reynolds, who, as you'd know, Pat has written an enormous amount about what we might call Australia's black history, black in the sense of Aboriginal history and black as a, as a bleak history. And many years ago, Henry wrote a book called Why Weren't We Told? And the title of the book came from his experience of going around the country, talking to white Australians, talking to reconciliation groups and telling them about Australia's black history. And he reckons they asked this question, why weren't we told? And apparently Henry used to say, well, once I was like you, I didn't know, but then I did all this research and now I'm telling you. But I think many of us think that the way Henry could also have answered that question was, why didn't you listen? So in other words, I think the Uluru Statement is important in, in saying, well, we should have truth telling. But I actually think that truth telling has been going on for a long time in this country. There hasn't been a silence. There's been a lot of truth telling. And most importantly, by Aboriginal people. And William Cooper is an example of that kind of truth telling. And so, yes, perhaps we do need more truth telling. But I think what's really required is what I would call truth listening. Mm -hmm. To listen to those like William Cooper, those like yourself, and so on. What should Mr. Cooper be remembered of? He did many things, but what should he be remembered for? And why is he really so absent from the public consciousness? And I, I take your point that listening is a, an art that uh, is held by few, uh, but, um, but this man has spanned, he was a very modern man back in the, in the 1920s and 30s, advocating for a, a, a representative in the parliament uh, to represent and deal with Aboriginal affairs. He, he did some very wonderful uh, uh, consultations with, his, with other Aboriginal leaders across this country in a time when it was so difficult. So what, what should he be remembered for? And, and why is he so absent from the public consciousness? Because he, he comes to prominence, as you point out in the book, through a, an author called Turnbull, a journalist called Turnbull, who um, gives him voice in the public space, which was an extraordinary thing in its own right at the time. Yes, in my view, William Cooper should be remembered, most of all, for the petition that he drew up in 1933. This was a petition to the British King. He drew it up on behalf of the organisation that he formed, the Australian Aborigines League, it's the petition that's finally presented to the federal government in 1937. And this is a petition, as you've said, Pat, that calls for Aboriginal representation in the federal parliament. I think this is really Cooper's most important political act. But Cooper is also responsible for other important political acts in the 1930s. Most importantly, perhaps, his call for a day of mourning a day of mourning to mark the sesquicentenary of the British settlement 
for the British invasion in 1938, in January 1938. I think this is an enormously important event, but it's generally not recognised that it was Cooper's idea. He was the one that first proposed it. Having proposed it, there were others, most importantly Bill Ferguson and Jack Patton, who took charge of the event. But in the first place, in the first instance, it was William Cooper's idea to hold a day of mourning. Alongside of that, uh, he and his organisation are involved in supporting what we could call a strike or a walk-off from Kamaragunja Reserve. And this, is, this was the reserve that he and his people, the Yorta Yorta, were very closely associated with. And in 1939, after fighting, fighting, fighting the New South Wales Aborigines Protection Board for better conditions on Kamaragunja, a large number of Cooper's people walk off in, in protest. And as I said, Cooper and the League are very much associated with that. Another thing that I think it's worth remembering, Paul, is a moment in 1939, 1940. In other words, this is a time when the Second World War has started. And there's this question of whether Aboriginal people, more specifically Aboriginal men, are going to join the Australian Armed Forces. And Cooper is appalled by this suggestion. Now, partly it's because he's lost one of his sons, um, Daniel Cooper, in the First World War. And he remembers that Aboriginal men returned from the First World War and were denied the rights and privileges that their fellow white soldiers were granted. And this really galled him. And he said to the federal government at the time, well, why should we fight to save this country, which has dispossessed us of our land? And he said, well, he argued that Aboriginal people shouldn't commit themselves, they shouldn't join the armed forces until they were given an undertaking that they would get citizenship rights now, not when they returned from the war, but now. It was more or less, in his mind, a condition that they should make before they, they, they joined the armed forces in the Second World War. Cooper's early life, then, what, what, what was it that made him become politically active? It was the experience of his son dying overseas in the First World War, still being treated as underclass or not even recognised as... Uh, was wrecking foreign fauna basically not even as human beings and seeing uh, minority groups internationally he was conscious of uh, the passion that uh, people had for such groups uh, in other nations but the lack of passion for the righting of the wrongs for the first nations in this country so what was it that uh, sparked him i suppose to to get politically active and uh, what was it in his upbringing that, that made him so, uh, so uh, dedicated and determined to pursue these causes? Well, he's very much drawing on his own historical experience and the experience of his people. So he's born in 1860. He's born in his own country, Yorta Yorta country on the banks of the R Murray River. By that time, the Yorta Yorta people had been largely but not entirely dispossessed of their land as the result of the pastoral invasion that had begun 20 years earlier. And he grows up, therefore, in a world where his people, as I've just said, have largely been dispossessed of their land. They've been decimated. They've been displaced. They've been deprived of many of the resources that his people once had. And to some degree, they are facing considerable discrimination. But Cooper and his people were relatively fortunate, and I emphasize the relatively, compared to other Aboriginal people they were able to retain some of the resources. Now they had the good fortune that their traditional lands had enormously rich resources. Archaeologists have said that the Yorta Yorta people had 
amongst the richest resources of any Aboriginal people in the country prior to the white invasion. And this is largely because they're on a river. And so even though they're dispossessed of much of their land and displaced from some of it, they still, they still have the river. And they, they, they are well used, to, of course, to, and very skilled at using that river. And so when the pastures come and push them off the land, they still have access to some of their resources. It's also the case that the area is relatively remote at the time that the, the pastoralists colonize it. And so they need Aboriginal labor. So all of this means that the Yorta Yorta are, are able to remain on their own country. And following that, in the mid 1870s, two missionaries, Daniel and Janet Matthews, form a mission, a mission that they call Maloga, near Barma on the, on, on the banks of the Murray River. And Cooper and his mother and some of his brothers and sisters are almost immediately drawn to this mission. Uh, some of Cooper's brothers and sisters stay. He returns in the early 1880s, and at that point, he converts to Christianity. Now, these missionaries, like many missionaries in the Australian colonies at that time, profoundly believed that Aboriginal people were fellow human beings, that they were also God's people. They profoundly believed, these missionaries, that Aboriginal people were what we would call the First Nations, that they had been wrongfully dispossessed of their land, and that the British Crown, the Australian colonies, had an obligation to them because they had dispossessed them of, of their land. And in my view, these missionary beliefs gave Cooper and the Yorta Yorta people a political language. And I mean, as you'd know better than I do, I suppose for Aboriginal people or for any Indigenous people to participate in the political system, the system of the colonizers, Indigenous people have at some, in some, to some degree talk the same kind of language, to, 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 to couch their demands in terms that the colonial system or the colonial regime will recognize. And this, is, this was a very important resource for Cooper and the Yorta Yorta. It's also true that the missionaries had connections with evangelical Christians in Britain who were very much involved in the anti-slavery campaign. And a key word in the anti-slavery campaign was emancipation. And this word, I became aware when I was working on the book, just repeatedly crops up in, in Cooper's writing to government, the term, the word emancipation. It's also the case, I think, that the, that, the, that the missionaries, and again, it's because I think of their connection with the anti-slavery campaign, they knew about, if you like, the tools of parliamentary democracy, the methods of parliamentary democracy, most of all, the method of petition, of petitioning government. And so from as early as the, as, as 1880, actually, or 1881, some of the Yorta Yorta, Cooper wasn't on um, Maloga at the time, but, but some of the Yorta Yorta people, including one or two of his brothers, are party to a petition called the Maloga Petition. And this is a petition that goes to the Governor General of New South Wales, sorry, the Governor of New South Wales, calling on the Governor to try and ensure that they were granted some of their own land, in effect. And so this is a, this is a world that Cooper grows up in, that his people become very adept, if you like, at petitioning governors. So again in 1887, and then again in the 1890s, Cooper is party to petitioning government. I mean, it's almost become second nature to him, that this is, this is one of the important ways in which you conduct, conduct politics. I think it's also the case that, that, that Daniel and Janet Matthews in their evangelical work in seeking to convert those like the Yorta Yorta to Christianity, that they relied a good deal, as you'd expect on, on the Bible, but in particular on the Old Testament. And I think that they taught Cooper and his fellow Yorta Yorta people to identify themselves with the Jews of the Bible. And in doing so, of course, one of the important, if you like, stories in the Old Testament is the promise to Jewish people 
that in the fullness of time, they will be returned to place. And I think Cooper grabs hold of this notion that sometime in the future, and I think there's a way in which Cooper, if you like, measured time or thought about time in terms of a biblical calendar. And so this idea that he has of, the, of a day of mourning, this comes out of this way of reckoning with time and reckoning with the world. And so Cooper thought of days of mourning, of days of hope, and so forth. And so, as I said, one of the reasons why Cooper is able to protest, I, I think we can probably just take it for granted that given you know, that he and his people are dispossessed, displaced, discriminated against, deprived, impoverished, that they will become political. But what I'm saying is that more than perhaps many other Aboriginal people, they were somewhat fortunate in that they, they re maintained some of their resources from traditional or pre-colonial times. They acquired new resources, um, adapt, adopting and adapting some of these ideas from the missionaries and learning about particular political methods of protest, most of all, most of all that of petitioning. Yes, and there was, wasn't there a, a uh, <coughs> excuse me, there a, uh, an influence uh, from uh, another group of uh, Christians, uh, I think from the, the Maldives or some part of uh, uh, outside of the, the sort of British mould in a sense, but very focused on the emancipation of the slaves and, and therefore the liberation um, that would come through some um, a, a one day by the petitioning, the truth, uh, the reflection back into the faces of the authorities of the appalling um, degradation to which uh, citizens have been turned to by their policies and behaviours. And, and this, this seemed something that also influenced um, Cooper. And I think uh, one of those particular pastors married into the Audi Order and became part of um, Cooper's family is... is what that influence seems to have a, also a, a very important part. Yes, look, this is this is absolutely vital. So, so as well as Daniel and Janet Matthews, there was this man, Thomas Shadrach James. Now, Thomas Shadrach James um, initially hailed from Sri Lanka. First of all, his people are from India. Um, his 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 parents, um, as far as we know, migrate to what became. Sri Lanka, or what was then called Ceylon, so uh, a, a British colony. His uh, Thomas Shadrick James's parents might have been recruited to work in the, the sugar industry, as I understand it, in Ceylon. But soon after they went there, Thomas Shadrick James converts from Islam to Christianity. He's um, people around him realize that he's enormously capable, he's very bright. Well, he comes, Thomas Jedrick James migrates to Australia, I think, first of all, to Tasmania in the early 1880s, and then moves to Melbourne. And he meets up with the Matthews and the Yorta Yorta. Um, they were in Melbourne at the time. He meets up with them. And he decides, if you like, to, to throw his lot in with the, with, with the Yorta Yorta. So he goes to Maloga and he becomes the teacher in the school. But he is not only the teacher of the children. He starts to run a class, at the very least for the men, in the evenings. And I think it's the case that Thomas Jedrick James really made action with what we might call an Indian diaspora. So he knows, for example, of the, of the conditions of Indian laborers in Fiji. He knows about other areas of the British Empire. He knows a great deal about the techniques of political or parliamentary democracy. And he teaches not just one generation of Yorta Yorta men, gives them a political education, I think we can say, so it's not only the likes of William Cooper, but Doug Nichols, Bill Onus, Jack Patton. I mean, it's a long, it's a long list. And as you say, he marries into the Cooper family. He marries one of William Cooper's sisters, Ada. And they in turn have several children. And their eldest son, 
Shadrach Livingston James, he, 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 he follows in his father's footsteps. He's highly political. He moves to Melbourne for a while in the late 1920s into the early 1930s. And he starts calling for change in Aboriginal policy, Aboriginal practice. And there's ways in which well, both he and his father anticipate so much of what William Cooper said later. At the same time, as I think it's clear that Thomas Shadrach James, the father, almost certainly drafted the Maloga petition um, of um, in the mid 1880s, and then Cooper himself petitions the New South Wales government in 1887, and I think Thomas James um, helped him draft that letter. And I think there's every chance that the 1933 petition to the British King of Cooper's, that Thomas James had a hand in that. And we certainly know that Shadrach James helped write some of the letters that were sent in Cooper's name to government from 1933 or 1934 onwards. So the James, their family, their kin, they are enormously important. And I suppose part of their importance lies in the fact that on the grounds of colour, loosely speaking, on the grounds that they were also had experienced colonisation, that Cooper and his fellow Yorta Yorta readily identified with them and with 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 Thomas Chadwick James and was was drawn was drawn to, to to him. And I think that's a really it's a crucial part of the story. I, I think so lot so often and probably this includes me in my earlier work on Cooper 20 years ago, we're inclined to think that the white fellas, the, 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 missionary, the white missionaries, Daniel and Janet Matthews, were the all important Christian influence. And I think I, I've now realized that that's a mistake um, on my part and on the part of other white fella historians, that the, the, the Jameses are, are terrifically important in this story. What is it about the, the physical everyday life experience and encounter on the on the government camp or on the government settlement, the treatment uh, by the bureaucrats at the board levels of uh, New South Wales uh, Aboriginal Protection Board and the Victorian uh, government. What's all of that doing to Cooper, and why is it that he's then capable, uh, or not capable, he's driven then to engage not just with petitions, but to actually go into doors and talk to, uh, you know, Menzies and talk to um, McEwen and, and other politicians and, and demand of them uh, some uh, responsiveness to the circumstances. So he, he wasn't just a, a passive man. He was very mm -hmm. much proactive, internationalist, um, well, uh, well uh, instructed by, you know, the numerous contacts he had around Australia uh, and, and fearless in... in uh, going through the barriers, as it were. Mm. To answer that question, I, I think it's really important that we recognise that there was, if you like, a moment of Aboriginal recovery after the devastation of, if you like, the first phase of colonisation. That with the, if you like, partly the coming, coming of the missionaries I spoke of before, that there... And the, and the point I made before that the Yorta Yorta were able to retain some resources and acquire some new ones. Now, there was a period from the middle of the 19th century to the early 20th century when Cooper and his people on Kamaragunja start to recover from the ravages of colonisation. First at Maloga, and then when Maloga is succeeded by Kamaragunja, just really up the river. So Maloga was a mission and Kamaragunja was originally a mission. It was this, it, and it came under the control of a philanthropic organization based in Sydney called the Aborigines Protection Association, who were in their own way sympathetic towards Aboriginal people, recognized they'd been dispossessed of their land, deprived of resources, and were willing to fight on their behalf. It's also the case that there were local white figures most importantly, there was a man by the name of John Chanter, who was the local parliamentarian 
for the Yorta Yorta in the New South Wales Parliament. He's a very important figure for, for, for Cooper and other Yorta Yorta people. He's the one they write to above all else in the 1880s, 1890s. Chant is sympathetic. He takes up the cause. He's probably responsible for ensuring that the New South Wales government creates a larger reserve of land for Aboriginal people at what becomes Kamaragunja. So what's happening here is that the local white fellows, or at least some of them, I don't want to overstate this, but at least some of them, they know Aboriginal people on a day-to-day -day basis, if you like. They encounter them. They know they're good workers. They know they're Christians. And I think they respect them. They admire them. But what's important is this, if you like, this face-to-face. And then what happens is what I'm calling this Aboriginal recovery. It gets very, very badly undermined. And what happens is that Kamaragunja as a reserves in New South Wales increasingly falls under the control of the New South Wales Aborigines Protection Board. That in the beginning, the Protection Board was, was content for organisations like the Aborigines Protection Association, that body of private philanthropic men and women to maintain oversight of Kamaragunja, but then they decide that they want oversight. And so what happens really, and it's not so much at the level of government in the sense of political figures, but it's what we might call administrators, bureaucrats. They start to empower themselves. They increasingly take control of Aboriginal affairs and they don't know Aboriginal people. They, they, they don't encounter them on a day-to-day -day basis. They are in Sydney. They are remote from reserves like Kamaragunja. And they, unlike those like John Chanter, who had, a, I think, a real sense of responsibility to Aboriginal people because he knew that they were the first peoples, that they, they were the original owners of the land. But in the 1910s, 1920s, 1930s, these bureaucrats, these administrators, start to implement really harsh policies. This is the time when, and as you would know, Pat, when Aboriginal children begin to be separated from their family, from their kin, by the New South Wales Aborigines Protection Board. And that certainly occurs on Kamaragunja, and it causes, not surprisingly, enormous dismay and provokes a lot of protest by the Yorta Yorta against, against this happening. Kamaragunja had started to prosper before the board started to seize control. And one of the things that the, that the Yorta Yorta men and women had pressed for is on the reserve, they wanted their own parcels of land to be able to farm. They were granted some of the resources they needed to farm this land. And then the Wales Aborigines Protection Board turns around and says, no, we're going to break up these parcels of land. Now, those like Cooper, believed, and I think rightly so, that the Aborigines Protection Association, when it was in charge, had given them a guarantee that these parcels of land were there. They weren't given title to it, but it was a, you know, it was a solemn undertaking. This, this is, this is you know, we're returning to you, mm. a very small part of your land. And then the New South Wales Protection Board says, no, we're going to break up these parcels of land. We're going to, we're going to take control of all of this. We're going to appoint a white overseer to manage your work. And Cooper and his fellow Yorta Yorta are, they're furious, they're embittered, and they, because they know how to do it and they still have some allies outside of the Aborigines Protection Board and in the community, they fight against this. But they are increasingly losing some of the power that they had before. And they are then regarded as political troublemakers. So some of them are forced off Kamaragunja. So Kamaragunja, they've come, you know, they've been on Kamaragunja since the mid 1880s. Their children have been born there. This is home for them. And the Protection Board forces these so-called troublemakers off the reserve. Now, as far as I can tell, Cooper was not one of those who were forced off the reserve. He decided off his own accord that he wasn't going to put up with being pushed around that this was intolerable. And so one of the pieces, if you like, of good fortune of the Yorta Yorta is that it's not just that they're on the Murray River, but of course the Murray River is the border 
between New South Wales and Victoria. This of course mattered a great deal before Federation, but even mattered a lot after Federation. So they could cross the river from Kamaragunja on the New South Wales side into Victoria. And the New South Wales Aboriginal, Aboriginal Protection Board then didn't have any authority in regard to them. So Cooper in around about 1909, 1910, as far as I've been able to gather, he decides that he's going to leave Kamaragunja. All the time he'd been on Maloga and Kamaragunja, like many of the other Yorta Yorta men, there was never enough work. There was, a, there was never enough land at Kamaragunja to be able to prosper fully. And so he continued to work in the pastoral industry using the skills that he had learned as a, as a boy, as a, as a young man. This takes him all over Australia. I mean, one of the reasons, which is important to note as well, why Cooper, I think, is so politically effective, it's not just the influence of the Jameses and, and the Matthews, is that after 1900, um, as part of working in the pastoral industry, he, you know, he becomes a trade unionist. He, we know, going back to the 1890s, that Cooper was part of the famous sharers strike that occurred at that time. We also know that he was a trade unionist, that he had subscribed to one of the major trade union newspapers, the Australian Worker. In other words, what we're saying is that Cooper was very well connected to the labour movement. And I think he came to represent not only his own people, but other workers in, in the trade union movement. So all of all of this before he goes to Melbourne in 1933, by which time you know, he's in his he's 70s, he has, if you like, steadily been gathering political resources. But to go back to the, the point you were making and the question you were asking, there's this enormously bitter experience of what I'm calling recovery, regaining some of their land only to lose it again regaining some of their autonomy and some of their independence, only to have that undermined. And so when Cooper goes to Melbourne in 1933, and he almost very soon after he goes there, he launches this petition to the British King. He, he's drawing, if you like, he's acting out of, he's been driven, as you've said, he's been driven by this experience that he's, that he's shared with shared with his people. What, what's the, um, they obviously would have heard of Camera, not Camera Gunja, the, um, the more successful place in Victoria down at um, uh, the community south. Cor Corrandurk. Corrandurk. And ultimately people mm -hmm. from Corrandurk moved up into Camera Gunja, but that, that autonomy that Corrandurk had, uh, and then the way in which that was again, uh, mm. thwarted and you know abused again people were abused uh, so the, the pattern of the way the bureaucracy the governments and their agencies were treating people became far more um, etched I think in Cooper's mind that this wasn't just a singular matter this mm. was systemic this was uh, not only across Australia systemic but internationally this was starting to uh, bear upon you know the rights of minorities really yes look that's absolutely right so at coroner um as you would know and many people would know one of the central figures is william barrett and in 1881 or thereabouts william barrett goes with one of his sons who is very ill like many aboriginal people he's suffering from tuberculosis and they leave coroner which is a you know, relatively cold place to live. And they go to Maloga, recognising that it's warmer. And William Barrett takes his son there, hoping that this will enable him to, to survive the tuberculosis. And while they're there, there's no question that they talk to the Yorta Yorta about what's happened, the conflict between them and the Victorian Board for the Protection of Aborigines. It's also the case that very soon after Coroner was founded in 1863, that Daniel Matthews, among others, encourages some of the young Yorta Yorta, some of the children, to, to go to Coroner. Matthews, from the mid-60s, wants to establish a mission 
the mission that becomes Maloga, but he doesn't have the resources, he can't get the support he needs at that time. And he encourages a not insignificant number of Yorteor to, to go to Conduit. And then in the 1880s, those people return and they bring with them this political knowledge, this political experience, and the experience of, you know, again, being threatened with, with, with dispossession. And so there's a real, you know, there's, there's this, this, this tradition, if you like, this lineage of, 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 of political protest, of, 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 because Barrack and, uh, and the other Kulin people, they, well, they became famous for the protests that they, they conducted at Corinthia. But as you've, as you've said, Pat, it's also the case that those like Cooper and the Jameses, they are avid readers of newspapers. And probably at that time, the press covered international affairs even better than it does now because newspapers were in a healthier state. And Cooper is very familiar with, with some of what has gone on in New Zealand. I think he, he went there and worked for a while as a sharer. And he certainly knows that Māori were granted parliamentary representation, that there were four Māori seats in the New Zealand Parliament from 1867. And so with his petition to the King, and it's the demand, as we've said, the demand for parliamentary representation of Aboriginal people, he repeatedly tells government, including one of the Prime Ministers of the time, Joseph Lyons, he repeatedly draws their attention to the fact that Māori have had parliamentary representation since 1867. And what he's saying to them, to, to Lyons and his colleagues as well, what at Māori have been granted, we too should be granted. So he knows, he, he, he knows about, as you say, other minority peoples, other indigenous people. As I said before, the Jameses are connected with the Indian diaspora and they're following what is happening to indigenous people in other areas of, of the British Empire. The, the fact that um, Cooper is also physically talking to people like uh, Lyons, uh, Menzies, um, uh, old Black Jack, um, McEwen, uh, yep. McEwen, yep. Uh, you know, and, 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 and obviously engaging with this political structure. To the extent where uh, he got Lyons, I think, to the position where he was prepared to get some re some work done by the bureaucrats on his petition, and obviously the the bureaucrats, um, this is where the point you made earlier, take their own view about the significance of the petition, and uh, basically torpedo it. Is is that the way you read this? Mm. It Absolutely. So I think I think Lyons was sympathetic. Um, I don't think historians, at least, like myself, until I started working on this book, grasped that Lyons did seem to be sympathetic. Um, the journalist you mentioned before, Turnbull, who um, interviewed William Cooper in 1937, um, was somebody who'd grown up in Tasmania. And I think he was drawn... To Cooper and sympathetic to Cooper because, of course, he knew what had happened to Aboriginal people in, in, in Tasmania. It's also said, I don't think Turnbull said this, but somebody else suggested at the time that one of the reasons why Lyons might have been sympathetic to Cooper is because he too, Lyons, was from Tasmania. So he was very well familiar with you know, the devastation, um, the near destruction of Aboriginal people in, in Tasmania. But as you said, what, what happens is... Lyons refers the petition to what was called at the time the Minister Ministry for the Interior. Um, the Minister of the time refers it to the chief bureaucrat, a man by the name of Carados. Carados was arrogant. He was scathing about the central demand of the petition. He said, oh, well, it was all very well for Māori to be granted parliamentary representation, but Aboriginal people had no, no such capacity. And he effectively kills the petition. It's also, as you probably know, Pat, it's also the case that this petition never reached the British king. The British no. king. And it, no one knows where this petition is. Apparently, National Archives, which holds so many of the letters that Cooper sent to the federal government, they have searched high and low, apparently, for this petition. 
Now, I have this awful feeling that Caridas, after he analysed the petition to work out who had signed it, which was an exercise he undertook to see if he could discredit it, and that's what he tried to do, obviously, I suspect he put it in the rubbish bin. But the, the petition had several thousand it had, yes, it had, it had a, it, or, or yep, marks. So, you know, it's quite a substantial... That's right. Document. And in this, um, to go back to this interview that Turnbull, um, this journalist Turnbull did with um, Cooper in, in, in September 1937, which was then published quite prominently in the Melbourne newspapers, The Herald. On the occasion that Turnbull interviewed Cooper, Cooper took out the petition to show him. He and one of his sons, Lynch Cooper, had pasted together all the sheets upon which Aboriginal people had put their signatures. There were about 1,800 signatures, and so it was quite a substantial document. But what's truly horrible, I think, is that Cooper, after he submitted it to the federal government, was really strung along. He wasn't told by the federal government what it was doing, that it was giving some consideration to the petition, and he certainly wasn't told when they decided that they were not going to take any action. They kept on telling him that it was under consideration. And so at times, I mean, not surprisingly, Cooper gets, he gets downhearted, he's, he gets, and he gets angry. The petition's ready to go by about 1935, and he tells the federal government he has it, but he's going to withhold it. He's not going to try and submit it to the British king. He's going to give the government a chance to introduce the policies and practices that he wants to be introduced, to give Aboriginal people a fair go. He holds it back. He has great hopes for a conference in 1937. It was the first ever conference of the administrators of Aboriginal affairs. He's bitterly disappointed by the outcome of this. And he writes to a federal minister, clearly drawing on, on the Bible, saying, we asked for bread and we only got a stone. He's really, really angry. I mean, he letters of this anger, but he's really angry in this letter. And as I say, he submits the petition. He's not informed, really, about the fact that the government is not taking this seriously, that they're not going to act. They're certainly not going to grant this demand for parliamentary representation. And so to the end of his life, he continues to hope. And the last letter, the last political letter that we, that's been to Robert Menzies as Prime Minister in August 1940. And the last line of that letter, on the last sentence, he's saying, what has happened to my petition? What has happened to this request for parliamentary representation? I think what's important for us to note here is why Cooper was seeking parliamentary representation for Aboriginal people. On more than one occasion, he told federal government ministers that Aboriginal people could, in his words, think black, and that white fellows, by and large, could not do that. So what did he mean by thinking black? At one point he said, well, you lot, you white fellows are the victors, you're the conquerors, and we are the sufferers. So what I think he was saying here was that Aboriginal people had had a particular experience particular experience of colonization. And that as a result, his people, the Aboriginal people, saw the world, saw Australia differently to the way that white fellas did. And so what he was saying is, you white fellas need our, our perspective. You can't run Aboriginal affairs without an Aboriginal perspective. You need to grant us parliamentary representation so that you have that perspective. And as you know better than I do, the awful thing is that here we are in 2021 with a call for a voice to Parliament. Cooper was calling for a voice in Parliament. That's, the fight goes on. And, and part of this is his deep, deep angst over his sense of the extermination of Aboriginal people. So it's not just being marginalised politically uh, and, and having a unique perspective on the interactions of the histories that have been taking place with colonisation. But he actually has this real deep angst about the extermination and, and ultimately the um, annihilation 
of Aboriginal people, the disappearance. And out of this comes this, this passion to, uh, in, in a very uh, moderate way, and, and it can be angry, but in a very mm. moderate way, appeal to the leaders who have the power and say, please listen to my plea. Now, isn't that the same as the Uluru Statement in many ways? Yeah, and absolutely. And and there's this phrase that Cooper uses in his interview with Turnbull. And I, as you gather, I keep going back to this interview with Turnbull. One of the reasons I do so is that, yes, we have all these letters of William Cooper, but his forte was talking. I mean, and he didn't get the chance to talk face to face with hardly any of these ministers. He wrote letters to them, but his forte was talking. He was eloquent. He was articulate. But on his own admission, he struggled to write. He had very little formal education. He read very well, as far as I can tell, but writing was difficult and he needed he needed the help of others like, like the Jameses. And so in this interview with Turnbull, it's one of the few occasions in the historical record that we hear him, so to speak, speaking. He talks and as he's talking to, to Turnbull. And as far as I recall, in this interview, he uses this phrase, racial memory. I think it's a, a really illuminating. And what he says is this Aboriginal people have what he called this racial memory. And as you said, it's a memory of extermination and perhaps more especially feeling that white Australians wanted or sought to exterminate Aboriginal people. And he, he very asked, I think this lies behind eventually his idea for the day of mourning. But what happens is that in 1937, he and the members of the Australian Aborigines League are invited to an occasion to mark, it's either the birthday of John Batman or the birthday of Melbourne. And what's important to, to realise here is that the Yorta Yorta and William Barracks Coolin people they regarded Batman as a good man, not as a swindler, but as a good man, because Batman had made a treaty with their people. And by making a treaty with them, he had recognised them as being the owners of the land. And on this occasion in 1937, that Cooper and the members of the Australian Aborigines League go, the chief, the president of the Australian Natives Association, which of course is a white nationalist organisation, gives a speech in praise of white Australia. And Cooper is appalled. And he writes to an organiser, the organiser of this um, commemoration, a man by the name of Isaac Selby, who was also like Cooper in his 70s. And he said, well, you know, we expected to go and commemorate Batman as a good man. We, we, he said, I didn't expect to be lectured on white Australia with no mention whatsoever about Aboriginal people. And he, he uses some phrase like white, the white fellows have sated themselves on Aboriginal blood. So it's this very clear reference to the killing of Aboriginal people, the extermination of them. So this is this is, as you say, this is really important. What drives this work? There's this 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 memory of this threat of, ex, of of extermination, and in the petition itself, apart from calling for parliamentary representation, he calls on the federal government, or, or rather the British King, to act to ensure that Aboriginal people are not exterminated. Obviously, the, the, the question arises, you're a historian, you, you um, um, have had, a, a, you know, previously you mentioned, uh, encountered Cooper, but why have you decided to embark upon this particular uh, exercise of, of bringing Cooper's endeavours together and presenting it in, in such a detailed research and, and very easily uh, understood manner for, you know, the average punter. Uh, why have you bothered to do this? Well, one of the reasons is that, well, to be honest, Cooper fascinates me. I think he's such an interesting figure and an important figure. And, and clearly what he had to say, certainly in terms of his call for parliamentary representation, just continues wrongly, in a way, to be so important. So there are some really important resonances, obviously, for me. And it's, this is not just 
history in the sense of something that's that's in the past. This is history, its connection to the present, its importance to the future. So I'm drawn back to Cooper for that reason. I'm also drawn back to him because I've come to believe that in the way that some of my fellow academic historians are doing work in this field, that they are not approaching it sufficiently in terms of what academic scholars, to say nothing of Aboriginal people, have called the approach of Aboriginal history. So back in the 1970s, there was a group of scholars, historians, anthropologists, archeologists, linguists at the Australian National University. By this time, of course, there's, there's been the tent embassy, there's growing militant Aboriginal protest. And they believe by this time, there are historians working on the history of relations between Aboriginal and white people. But this group at the ANU are very critical of the approach. There's a lot of emphasis on the white fellas point of view, racism, the violence of the frontier. Well, they recognize that this was a really important story to tell. But they wanted to tell the story, approach it in a different way. And they called this approach, the approach of Aboriginal history. Well, what did that mean? This was an approach that very much focused on Aboriginal people. It was also an approach which focused on what historians would call historical agency. In other words, the capacity of people to shape their lives, at least to some degree. But perhaps most importantly of all, this was an approach which emphasised Aboriginal perspectives. In other words, Aboriginal ways of seeing in the past. These people also thought that the approach should be interdisciplinary, that you couldn't just approach the past by using the techniques that historians have been using for a long time, principally by relying on the white historical record. And so in the founding of Aboriginal history, it mattered enormously that there were people other than historians involved, perhaps most importantly, the anthropologist Diane Barwick. She was by the stage very accustomed to learning about Aboriginal people's history from their point of view by talking to them, by doing oral history, by gathering oral tradition. So these people, including Diane Barwick, they found this journal, the journal that comes to be called Aboriginal History. They founded it in 1977 and it flourished for a while and, and I think became quite influential. This is also the time that Henry Reynolds publishes what is probably his most important book. In 1981, he publishes a book called The Other Side of the Frontier. I came to the view that in recent times, my fellow white academic historians weren't doing enough of Aboriginal history and that this was fundamental. I've, I've taught what I call Aboriginal history at Monash University now for a long time, more than 30 years. And in the course of doing so, I've come to what I think what well, might strike you and others is, is a rather mundane insight, but I think I like to think it's quite profound. I've come to the view that that white fellows in this country need a particular history told, and they need to listen and they need to learn it, and it's the history of the dispossession, destruction, decimation, displacement, deprivation of Aboriginal people. But I've also come to a view that this is not a story that Aboriginal people will necessarily want to tell or need to tell, that they will have different interests, at least to some degree. Yes, they will want the story that I've just mentioned told, the story of dispossession and destruction and decimation and displacement and dis discrimination. But I think that they will want and need another kind of story, another kind of history being told. And it's a story that depicts them of their ancestors as having, in my terms, some historical agency, in other words, having some power over their own affairs, and perhaps most importantly, a history that will reveal their perspective, their ways of seeing the world. Now, clearly Aboriginal people themselves will tell that kind of story, but I thought that I could also play some role in telling that kind of story through the lens of William Cooper. And there's probably a third reason. Um, the discipline of history I've increasingly thought over the years is, is only one way of, of 
of telling stories about the past. I mean, <laughs> you would know that better than I do. There's other ways. And in this book, while I largely try and tell William Cooper's life using the historical sources that an academic historian tends still to rely on, the written record, that in order to try and really understand Cooper better and represent his life, I needed to, it's like, broaden my perspectives and consider other sources. One of the things that the book does, and I feel very fortunate in this regard, is it includes a large number of photographs. And the publisher, Melbourne University Press, allowed me to include almost as many photographs as I wanted. And I included what I think are wonderful photographs. Many of these photographs are held by members of Cooper's family. And it's very clear that Cooper treasured these photographs. These are photographs sometimes of him on his own, photographs of him and his uh, children, photographs of him talking to the other members of his British League. And in the book, I've been fortunate enough to have the permission of members of his family to include some of these photographs. And I think some of them are wonderful photographs. For example, after Cooper moved to Melbourne in 1933, he largely lived in Footscray. And there's this photo, it's held by one of the members of his family, of him walking, indeed striding down Nicholson Street, the main street of Footscray. And what's that saying, that a picture can is better than a thousand words or, or whatever <laughs> it is? And in this photo, as I said, Cooper is striding down the street. He is, you know, he's erect. He has enormous bearing. And you just get a sense of, of the dignity of this man and his energy. I mean, he's in his mid-70s by this point, but he's, he, you just get the sense of the power of this figure. I mean, I, I don't get that same sense from the, from, from the words, the written record. I mean, partly because, as I said before, he has, you know, like so many Aboriginal people, he was denied the right to have a good education. And yes, we get some sense of his voice and the people who work with him helping him to write letters, they try and preserve some of his voice. But it's nothing like when he speaks in the interview with Turnbull that I referred to before, and the sense that you get from these photographs. So I suppose what I'm saying um, is, well, the written words are all very well, but what do we get when we have visual material, photographs and the like? It's also the case that I think that the sense of Cooper as an Aboriginal man, his Aboriginality is most apparent in these folks like family and kin. And when he and the other members of the Australian Aborigines League sing. Now, unfortunately, we don't have any records of them singing, but we know that they performed concerts in Melbourne. Partly it was a way of raising money for the cause, but partly it was a way of conveying their message. And they sang not only English songs and they sang not only in English, but they sang songs in Yorta Yorta. And Margaret Tucker, who was one of the members of the Australian Aborigines League, in performance, she not only uses her English name, Margaret Tucker, but she uses a Yorta Yorta name, which as far as I understand, Cooper had bestowed upon her. So there's these kind of glimpses in the context of performing, the oral, the oral. You get another, you know, the sense. So this is a very long-winded way of saying that for me, I wanted to go back and recover an Aboriginal person's life as best I could, trying to use a range of sources. And then in addition to these, I... I talked a good deal with members of the Cooper family. Uh, his surviving grandson, Uncle Bordy Turner, who's in his early 90s and um, still going strong, has some memories of his grandfather. He was with Cooper in the late 1930s in Footscray. He's very young, so you know, as you'd expect of anybody of young years, he only has some memories, but, but, he, but nonetheless, he's, if you like, the, you know, the last living link we have with, with, with William Cooper. And, you know, I was aware that the oral tradition um, has a particular account of Cooper and sometimes it converged with mine and sometimes mine that's based largely on the written record and sometimes it diverged. And, and that, that's important to note that I suppose what I'm saying here is 
an Aboriginal person will tell Cooper's story differently to what I've done. I've done my best as a white fellow to, to, to do this. Yeah. Look, I, I think you've done a, I think you've done a marvelous job with it. And if I can just recall when I first went to Victoria back in the '60s, when the we were still labouring under this notion that we were a dying race. And I'd come to meet uh, the lovely Mrs. Tucker uh, and Nicholas Nichols and his wife and, and other players and other descendants that have come out of uh, Kamragunja. And of course, got to know um, the Briggs family and others over the years. Uh, and my own Irish ancestry uh, were at, uh, parked up at... Um, at uh, around Echuca, so just on the other side of uh, uh, the Victorian side of the Murray there from from Kamragunja. So uh, the, I've always had this fascination and interest, but it, the, the anomaly always seemed to be the, 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 the contrast, as you mentioned, the, the photograph of Cooper walking down, um, you know, Nicholson Street in Melbourne and yet being treated as a non-citizen. And, and less than a non-citizen and, and having the same sort of uh, attitudes being expressed in contemporary days about Aboriginal people that uh, we're, we're not, you know, how can you have a voice? He was talking about a voice inside the parliament, <laughs> not a voice to the parliament, but, you know, and, and yet this, this huge fear about this. What is it from your research here where the institutional political structures and the bureaucrats and the particular players, what do they get from you having written this book? Because it seems they don't reflect, they don't listen to the messages that, that have come forth from this marvellous presentation of a man's great life. Maybe I'll answer the question in a, in a way that only partially will answer it. What I'm struck by, and it's because I originally came from New Zealand. I spent my first 25 years there, which is to say I've now lived most of my life here in Australia, specifically in Melbourne. And I don't, I don't want to overstate the differences between New Zealand and Australia. The, the, the similarities in regard to Indigenous people, I, I think, are greater than the differences. But I nonetheless think the differences matter. And the differences are often attributed by many people, including well-meaning people, to cultural differences. And the last book I wrote, not this book on William Cooper, but a book I published last year, which is called The Making of Native Title. In a way, it revolves around the question of why British make a treaty, the Treaty of Waitangi in New Zealand, why did the British Crown do that? And why didn't they do so here? And I was very critical of most of the explanations that have been this, which tend to revolve around cultural differences. And the argument I put, it's a rather complicated argument, so I won't try and rehearse it here, but at the heart of the argument is my emphasis on historical factors, but more specifically on the sequence in which colonisation occurred. And the difference is this, that in New Zealand, like in North America, both what becomes the United States and Canada. When British colonization begins, it's not done by the British Crown, it's not done by government. And so what occurs is small parties of British wash up, so to speak, on the shores of North America and on New Zealand. And they are relatively powerless. They recognize they're relatively powerless. They want to obtain access to some of the resources of Māori, and uh, Indigenous people in North America. So what do they do? They negotiate. They treat the Indigenous people as though they're sovereign. So I'm not talking about whether, you know, in some high kind of theoretical or conceptual sense, they think Indigenous people were capable of being sovereign or owners of the land. It's on the ground, it's face to face. They want access to the land, these British subjects, and so they negotiate. They end into agreements which they understand as agreements to purchase land they treat the indigenous people as sovereign so in new zealand what happens is that by the time the british crown decides that it wants to try and annex new zealand in 1840 
by that stage you've had something like well, all the periods since Cook had claimed possession of New Zealand in 1769 and 1770. So 70 years, three generations. And during that time, there grew up this practice of treating with Māori, treating with them, treating them as sovereign, treating them as the owners of the land. And so along comes the British Crown, and they actually don't have much sense of Māori power. But they realise that there are a whole number of British subjects who are claiming land in New Zealand on the basis of what we would call native title, on the basis that they have purchased it from Māori. And they know that some of these British subjects are actually quite powerful, and they know that these British subjects are going to tell the British Crown to bugger off if they claim that Māori don't have rights to land. And the British Crown is in a real quandary here, but they realise that they have to treat Māori as sovereign, and they have to treat them as the owners of the land, and that's what they do. So compare this to New South Wales. So Cook, what's really important to note here, I think, is that Cook claims possession of huge swathes of Australia on the very same terms as he claimed possession in New Zealand, basically on the basis of what was called the doctrine of discovery. This was a claim which was really made against other European powers more than it was made against the indigenous people. But what's important here is that this is the way Cook claimed possession in New Zealand, but then the British Crown didn't proceed to claim New Zealand on that basis. As we know, they negotiated with Māori on the basis that Māori were sovereign and the owners of the land. So why didn't this happen in New South Wales? Well, two reasons, and again, it's, it's, it's about my point about historical sequence. That in New South Wales, as we know, they decided to plant a colony at Botany Bay relatively soon after Cook came possession, you know, 10, 15 years afterwards. And no other British subjects had started to colonise there, unlike in New Zealand. And so when the British Crown arrives, so to speak, in 1788, well, I'll put that another way. When the British arrives, it's in the form of government. And it's an armed government. They have, they have you know, they come, it's an armed force. And then New South Aboriginal people around Botany Bay are devastated by a smallpox epidemic. The first governor, he, he doesn't altogether buy James Cook and Joseph Banks' accounts of Aboriginal people. He thinks they're going to be more numerous. He tells the British government when he's appointed to be governor that he thinks that when he arrives, he's going to have to, in his words, throw up some kind of fortification. And then, partly because I think Aboriginal people are decimated in that area by sm smallpox epidemic, that none of this treating for land, nothing like the tradition that grew up in New Zealand emerges. Now you'll be saying, this is taking a very long time to answer my question. What I'm talking about here very loosely is that after 1840, it took a while in New Zealand, but after a while in New Zealand, the British colonizers come to realize just how powerful Maori were. I mean, first of all, even, even in you know, 1843, there's a, there's a moment where the New Zealand Company, which was a company of private colonizers, they try and swipe land of Māori in the top of the South Island in one of the most important Māori rangatera, Te Rapraha. He gives them the shove off and um, the whites fire first, it seems, and they kill some of Te Rapraha's people and they respond and they massacre. And the British go, oh, we didn't know Māori were so powerful militarily. It takes a while for them to sink in, but then Later, just as Aboriginal people fought back here. But by that time, there were all these perceptions that Aboriginal people were not very powerful. But what happens, without overstating it, in New Zealand's history, Pākehā, non-Māori New Zealanders, at least have some appreciation that Māori, that, that, that Māori are powerful. And you don't need to be so fearful of it. So, uh, you know, I don't need to remind, <laughs> remind you. How did those like Barn Barnaby Joyce uh, respond to the Uluru State? Oh my God, my Aboriginal people are going to be powerful. And so I'm being facetious and I, and sorry, I, I, I shouldn't be, but I think this is, this is, there is apprehension, there is fear because us white fellas are not used to the likes of yourself <laughs> being powerful. It's, it's unfamiliar territory. And I think where there's unfamiliar territory, there is apprehension, there's fear, 
there's anxiety. Even though the likes of William Cooper said, it's all right, it's all right. We're not asking that much, you know, and we're, we're doing it in a very measured way. We're not taking up guns or so forth. Even though, of course, he remembers the guns being pointed at. Oh, he does, does indeed. And uh, it's, uh, it, it's just not only the, the fear of what we might represent, but it's also the fear of the confrontation of their own inner reflection that they've stolen this from some. <laughs> they have displaced people with awful policies, as Cuba kept pointing out, but even in that vein was prepared to say, surely we are entitled to be treated better, even though you've taken everything from us and you've subjugated us to, to your control and management, we are at least entitled to be treated better and to have access to a quality of life, basically. Yes, I mean, what comes to mind for better or worse is, do you remember there was a Lunig cartoon back in 1997, so after the Bring Them Home report is released. Yes. In this cartoon, the white fellas are saying, you don't know how much work we've put into oppressing you lot. <laughs> and what I took Lunig to be saying was, well, that's white fellas know that we've treated your people so badly. And so we fear, do we fear that you're going to wreak revenge on us because we know how badly we've treated you? I mean, this is, as you say, I mean, there's this, this knowledge, this knowledge which is, is repressed. Um, I mean, it's what I, uh, what I call, and others call, the phenomenon of denial. I don't use the word or the term denial in any simple sense. I use it in the sense actually that Freud, the founder of psychoanalysis, used it, where he defined denial as a state of knowing and not knowing, or what I would call a state of knowing what you've done, but not willing, not being able or willing to acknowledge what has happened, what's being done. Yes. And um, I think this is, I mean, I don't think this is easy. I don't want to say that it's easy for the colonizers to acknowledge, to accept what's been done. I don't think we should say this is simple because all peoples identify with their history and hearing and listening to what is this very bleak and black history in many ways is, is confronting. Um, and I think it's important not to represent a task that's difficult, coming to terms, working through a bleak past. I don't think we should pretend that a difficult task is easy. I think that's a, I don't think it's a mistake that Aboriginal people make, but I think it's a mistake that people like myself are inclined to, are inclined to make. Yes, and maybe that this is probably simply one of the last questions I'll get in, in this discussion, but it's been wonderful listening to you, but you reflect on the, Australian Parliament today, where you have, I think, five or maybe six Aboriginal members of Parliament. And uh, you would hope that this would diminish the fear as the dialogue, the cut and thrust in a common uh, platform, uh, as Parliament is, would begin to free up people from their fears to deal with the challenges that we've got from the Uluru Statement uh, to the heart and a voice to our moderate pat request is, a voice to the parliament, a truth-telling process and, and an agreement-making process around things that uh, will enhance us all as Australians. Now, do you have any commentary on, on that? You know, what would Cooper have thought seeing even someone like... Uh, you know, the Green Senator from Victoria now in the Parliament um, speaking about such things as were dear to his heart. I expect he'd both, he'd be surprised, perhaps amazed and overjoyed. Um, but can I, can I, can I ask you a question? It's really to um, put the question that you've just put okay. to me. I, I guess I'm interested to, to, to know whether in the period that you've been in Parliament, alongside your fellow Indigenous parliamentarians, whether you have any sense that, that the way they're responding to you, the way they're responding to being what's put to them, the Uluru Statement and so forth, have you seen any change? 
I, I think if I measured it against the life of someone like William Cooper, it's very incremental and at a snail's pace. There, there's no immediate revelation that takes place across the across the aisles. There's some empathetic positions, but shifting political ideology and historical assumptions about the position of First Nations peoples in this country is as tough inside the parliament as it is outside the mm. parliament, except that parties are held accountable by their electors and ultimately the significance of what's being put forward in a moderate, uh, clear way for justice, uh, not only in cultural heritage areas, uh, but in social justice and the way those policies are enacted, and for, uh, for a reasonable say on how the laws of this parliament or parliaments are going to impact Aboriginal people. I think they're gradually gaining credibility and are seen as non-threatening. And it might take another two parliaments before we wonder whatever the discussion was about. Can I ask you another question, which I, I think I found myself wondering about, well, in the middle of the night last night, but it's not the first time I've wondered about it. Whether there's any connection between denial and the way I'm using the word denial, denial of the climate crisis amongst many figures in Australia, was there a connection between that denial and the denial of Australia's black history? Oh, I think there's a direct connection. I think there's a direct connection because the assumption underpinning settlement and colonisation is that they tamed the wilds, they, they converted it towards productivity, it laid uh, un, unused, as it were, uh, and now they're finding that the techniques and activities and the abuse of the landscapes, the waters, um, and the uh, and the extraction of uh, minerals like coal are, are in fact doing more damage than the fire burning systems that created such a wonderful uh, topography when they first came and saw. It. Mm. I feel we could talk talk for hours, but I suppose we we better draw this to a close. Can I thank you very much, Senator Dodson, for this wonderful opportunity to to chat today? Um, I've, I've immensely in, enjoyed it and feel enriched by it. So, so thank you very very much. And can I thank the the Bob Hawke Prime Ministerial Centre at the University of South Australia and my publisher, Melbourne University Publishing, for hosting this event. Thank you.